WQAD News 8, this is WQAD This Week. Good morning, it's Sunday, June 11th. Thank you for joining us for News 8 This Week. I'm John Diaz. Lawsuits are piling up against the owner of the partially collapsed building in Davenport, as well as a city. And in one case, the attorneys representing a resident of that building also represented residents in the condo collapse in Surfside, Florida in 2021. They claim there are similarities between the two incidents. So this morning, we're looking back at the Surfside collapse and the aftermath with Jennifer Titus and Libby Hendren from our sister station in Tampa Bay, Florida. And joining us now is Jen and Libby. Hey guys, thanks so much for taking the time this week to talk with us and, and educate us a little bit about your experiences uh, in Florida. Um, I wanna start with talking about, uh, Jen, your initial impressions. You covered the Surfside condo collapse. When you first got out there, what do you remember most about you know, getting on scene and beginning the, the process of covering that story? When Surfside happened, it happened really early morning. So it was about a four hour drive for us to actually get down to Miami, to get down to the site uh, where the condo did collapse. And so once we got down there, we had a pretty good idea about that time about that. We knew that dozens of people at this point were missing. So it was kind of, I would say chaos. There was so many road closures. There was probably blocks of where we were pushed back because we couldn't actually get that close because we had, you know, half of the building still standing. They didn't know what was going to happen to the other part of the building. They were going through uh, a big rescue mission. Uh, there was still lots of smoke. I remember when we first got down there, even being blocks away, there was just smoke and and from the water that the firefighters was uh, were using. So I just remember being um, pretty far away. We set up at the Family Reunification Center, which for people that don't know, it's basically when there is a tragedy or, or something's happened and they're trying to get those back together with either family members or loved ones. They normally set up a spot, um, officials do, so they can have a spot for family members to go that are looking for somebody and get that uh, reunification back together. So I we we hung out there for the first for the first day or blocks away from the actual scene, but we never really got close to that area for a couple of days. In the days following, as uh, everyone's working to get answers, and you're engaging with, I imagine, city, state leaders, maybe first responders. What was that engagement like? Was there sort of really an open dialogue, or was there a challenge in trying to get uh, at least some of those initial questions answered? I think the biggest thing at first, because we had such a rescue mission going on the whole entire time, I would say we had about 100 people that were missing. So the focus right there for the first, I would say, couple of days was that we were just talking to law enforcement, rescue crews. I mean, they were bringing dozens and dozens of firefighters and law enforcement to the site because it was not only summer, June, it was hot. It was long days and they were going through so much rubble. They had to protect themselves. They had to make sure that people were trained for this type of a rescue um, and a, uh, a recovery. And so that's why really the focus for the first couple of days was that those were our questions of, you know, how many have missing, how many have been found so far? Uh, you know, what do we know about survivors? What do we know about victims? So those were really the questions to officials within those first, I would say, 48 hours. But we were still putting in those requests to the city of Surfside. And we were speaking with the mayor. We were, we were talking to the mayor within hours of the collapse about what he knew, uh, what his focus was on. But again, those records requests that we were making were for any sort of possible red flag that may have been within the city. Did Was there any recent inspections? Did they know of any problems with in the building? And within 48 hours, they the city ended up releasing dozens of documents that really gave us an insight on those red flags. Let's talk about those then a little bit. Um, here in Davenport, we're seeing, um, we, we've seen documents um, and, and there's been a lot of uh, talk that there are these red flags. Um, what did you guys uh, discover as you look through those documents and as you talk to people who may have been familiar uh, with what was going on in the building? First, I think it was very apparent that there were issues with the building because um, the initial reports were saying people had um, seen leaks coming from the pool. 
um, and the pool was with the parking garage. So people were driving through that parking garage and, and they were noticing water and, and knowing that there was an issue. Once we knew that there was a problem like that, we also started um, hearing about how the board, um, the condo board um, there at the towers had been looking through some um, repairs that they needed to do. And so it became apparent that that there were some issues with the building. Yeah, that they knew that they were in the middle of a reinspection process. What we had, what we learned that in two counties in the state of Florida, um, out of 67 counties, um, there are required reinspections every 40 years. So not for 40, for zero years. And so this building was going through that reinspection process. They were going through what needed to be done because they were up for that 40 year recertification process. And so those documents that Libby just mentioned, that's what they were undergoing. And that's when some of these problems were addressed. The, the you know, crack by the planter by the pool. Um, there were videos I remember looking at with water coming through the the garage she was just mentioning. So that's when we started really asking the questions then about, you know, the inspection process, the this re recertification process and and once every 40 years. And that's really kind of what everybody really kind of zoned in on. Have there been changes to laws that have come about as a result of um, the collapse there? Absolutely. They had a special session um, last year um, and they passed uh, a number of things uh, that now apply to condos. You know, condo owners, um, like I said, were um, trying to figure out what to do to um, make those payments and um, get the the things that they needed done with the building. And one of those things that you have to have as a board is uh, a reserve fund um, for when things like this happened. And that was one of the things that the legislature um, took into account. They said boards need to start fully funding those reserves for things that are really important, um, like the structure of a building. A downfall, if you will, to them passing that law, um, there's not enough engineers in Florida to actually do all those reserve uh, studies that need to be done um, and, and actually um, go and inspect the buildings as well. Um, so they've been making some tweaks to the law um, that they originally passed. They came back this year, um, changed you know, some of the time frames and stuff like that for uh, what's in place, but now, you know, there is a state law. And so boards, um, including my own board, are having to look at our finances, uh, you know, and, and take a deep look at, at what it means to be a condo owner in Florida. And then the other thing that passed in that special session she, mess, uh, she mentioned is that um, recertification is now needed every 30 years for not just those two counties, but for every single county in the state. If you are a condo over three stories and then 25 years, if you are in a closer proximity to a um, ocean, a body of water. Yeah, the, the salt water was a huge contributing factor to what happened in Surfside. Um, and, and probably a majority of our condos are near shoreline of some sort. So um, it makes a lot of sense that the, that they give those a little more scrutiny. The search for answers, there's a lot of questions that I'm sure you asked. Um, do, do the answers come quickly or is there just a lot of patience that's required, not only on our part as journalists, but even just folks in the community who want to know why something happened? Well, even I think the national investigation that was done, the, the last report that I remember is there's still not one thing that they can pinpoint that this is why this happened. Like we know that there were these red flags, that there were concerns in place, but they never actually pinpointed it It was exactly this. So we still don't truly know why that building collapsed. And I think too, for the people that live near that particular uh, building, there's still a lot of questions about what it means for them. Um, cause even now there, there's been, um, uh, some things that have happened in those neighborhoods where they're like, okay, um, do we need to get out as well? 
and raise those questions about their own safety. And we've seen, uh, especially down there in that area, after they went back to see who was coming up to that 40 year inspection and they were going into these buildings and they were making evacuations from concerns that they did see, like if even if it was a balcony that was in having a problem, they were evacuating buildings. We were seeing a lot more inspections and scrutiny taking place after what happened. Obviously two very different situations, but I think we can clearly see some of the parallels uh, in these stories. Uh, obviously we'll continue to follow it. Uh, Jen, Libby, thank you so much for taking the time uh, this week to talk with us.